Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Let's Talk, presented by the Visiting Nurse and Hospice for Vermont and New Hampshire. As always, I'm your host, Anthony Knox. And today's discussion, uh, we have uh, Dr. Terry Malcolm, who is part of Dartmouth Health as a part of the DEIB uh, program, which is Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And so we're going to be talking about a, a wide variety of, of different things as it relates to the Dartmouth Health System, which includes all of all of the system partners, um, not just Dartmouth Hitchcock, not just uh, visiting nurse and hospice. It's it's everybody. It's the same value, the same mission, the same goal of, you know, the people that we serve, the individuals within our communities um, and just being able to to have a, a, an open discussion about um, what is happening, you know, what future planning is and, and kind of being able to go from there. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to, to Terry and uh, she'll give you a much bigger uh, introduction of herself and then we'll dive right in. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for the introduction and most certainly thanks for the opportunity to be here with you and members of our Dartmouth Health community internally as well as externally. This is a really exciting time for our, our institution. It's really exciting time for our organization and um, I think really exciting for our community at large too as we, we look to really fostering a sense of belonging within Dartmouth Health and you know, it's been almost a year now since I joined Dartmouth Health um, in, in April. I will officially be a year old, achieve, achieve that, reach that one year milestone. And so it's really been a, you know, it's been a year, of course, of learning, of listening, of growing, um, most certainly learning how to um, how to crawl, you know, within a very large uh, matrix organization, um, and then ultimately learning how to walk. And I really look forward to us running and, you know, sprinting in some cases with some of the work that is underway. And I'm excited to be able to share that, share that with you um, and share it with the audience too. You know, I'll take a minute just to kind of share since I'm uh, a little bit about myself since I am new to Dartmouth Health and I haven't had a chance to get to know everybody. I definitely have had a chance to meet a lot of people, but um, you know, with over 13,000 employees, it's hard to meet every single person individually. So I'll just share a little bit about um, about my my background and that you you introduced me as as doctor and that's true I am a physician I am a, an obstetrician and gynecologist board certified by by clinical training um, I specifically chose women's health because I loved the diversity within women's health and um, I function both as a general obstetrician and a general gynecologist. And I loved the complexity of the care. And I loved that my patients were so interested and so much so passionate about their health. Um, I did stop practicing. And I, I like to say that I hung up my forceps and my scalpel in order to um, put those on the shelf um, to really extend the impact that I could have in delivering exceptional care by improving processes and systems that really help people to be healthy so that they can achieve their best. So I, I come to Dartmouth Health with over uh, four decades of lived experience, of, of lived experience of being um, not only an only child, I am very blessed to be an only child of two amazing parents who, um, you know, who are still in very good health today and who I talk to on a very regular basis. I've already talked to my mom a couple times this morning. Um, but um, I also come to you as um, as someone who has very often been the only in situations and on healthcare teams and been, you know, the only at a at a board meeting or the only in a decision making meeting. And in, in my journey, I have found that to be very problematic. I know that my, you know, the experience of a black cisgendered female physician, which is how I identify, is not monolithic. And so there is no possible way that I can be the representative for everybody. I'm there to, you know, bring a different perspective, to bring a new perspective, to most certainly share my voice and to share what I hear from my colleagues and what I believe is important for um, to expand the conversation, but I find it problematic that I'm the only one. 
And so I've really made it, you know, a personal mission of mine. And I really believe that it's also my responsibility because of the privilege that I do have in the spaces and the places in which I get to engage and interact and the people that I have the opportunity to, to be around, that it's about creating space for everyone and for everyone to feel that their voices are being heard, their voices are being welcomed, their contributions are being appreciated. And all of that lends itself to feeling like you belong when you become part of an organization, when you become part of an institution and one with, you know, really centuries of of um, of a history like the Dartmouth ecosystem currently has. So, you know, I'm just, I'm excited. I'm really excited that our our office has been stood up. The office of DEI now exists. Um, I've got some amazing, um, really close partners, a left and a right hand that I get to work with every single day. But I'm also really excited about the partnerships and the bridges that we're building across the entire um, organization. So, um, you know, with that, I'd love to be able to just kind of share everybody a little bit like what we have in store, what we've been working, working on so far. And and our our journey is about from awareness to action. And, you know, I I um, you know, we worked in partnership with communications and marketing around this because what we're here to do is we're really here to transform. We're really here to shift um, from a maybe um, a less less inclusive, um, which may not have ex intentionally been exclusive, but it's been less inclusive, but shifting away from being unfamiliar, not knowing, lack of awareness to a place of knowing and with that understanding and with that um, recognition that you can then utilize that new lesson, that new learning that you have to actually translate it into action and knowing what can you do within your own respective space to advance DEIB and then to be able to see what the organization can do overall. So I think Anthony, you gave me control here and I'm gonna see, there we go. I can advance to the next slide. Perfect, there we go. All right, uh, excuse me for you know, being, a, being a little slow with the trigger, fig, trigger finger here, uh, but I, I will catch up. I may not be the fastest in the group, but I promise I do catch up. So, um, you know, for this, I just wanted to, to share that DEIB is real. it's a journey. It is really, it's not a destination. This is, you know, not, about trying to finish um, or just cross a finish line and you know pat ourselves on the back and and say we we've done a good job. I I know sometimes sports analogies really are overused and we can get a little tired of the sports analogies. But in the Malcolm household, um, we have three growing boys and swimming is our chosen sport. And so my our boys are really active swimmers. And the way that you know I think about this is. Our boys swim in races, so they compete. They compete in a pool, in an enclosed pool, where there's a set distance in which they're supposed to swim, whether that's you know 50 meters or 100 meters or 200 meters. So at the end of that race, they touch the wall, and the race is over. DEIB is not that destination endpoint like that, right? It is not just a prescribed distance in which you're going to engage in this work or engage in this efforts and where you can say, okay, I finished the race, we're done, nothing more to be completed here. It's really more like swimming out in the open waters where you may not know exactly where that endpoint is. You may not know exactly what, uh, you know, where the, the island is that you're trying to get to. You don't know exactly where the shore is but you know you want to get there and you have you have the vision you've set that as your goal of we want to strive towards that but there's going to be um some rocky waters along the way there might even be a storm that comes along the way and kind of tries to veer you off course but you keep in mind we've got to get to that shore and knowing that getting to that shore is about really creating a place that's better for everyone so this is a depiction of where we are and where we want to go on, on our journey. And we, we, we pulled this from our partnership with Cook Ross, which has rebranded to be equitable. So for those of you who have been part of Dartmouth Health since at least last 
last summer, or probably even might really be dating back to 2021, Dartmouth Health um, partnered with a global consulting firm who's really a leader in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, so that we could take a deep dive into what's working well, what's not working well, where do we really need to invest our energies and, and our focus. And they completed a very comprehensive, um, looking from the inside out, uh, assessment, which included uh, over three years of HR data, which included one-to-one -one focus groups and listening sessions, or sorry, one-to-one -one listening sessions with members of our senior leadership team, as well as multiple focus groups. And then a really comprehensive DEIB assessment, where we got specific data to ask our, our employees that we really wanted concrete feedback from our employees about what is important to them. And from that assessment, we scored in the first stage. We scored in the reactive stage. And this shows kind of where, as you think back, kind of the analogy of being out and swimming in the open water. So as you begin to embark, where we want to go is to a place of transformation. So to begin, Dartmouth Health is very early in jumping into the waters and responding more from a place of reactivity as situations or challenges arise. But you'll you'll see that we're moving more to a place now of proactive, where we are addressing things head on and coming up with new systems so that we can then build and enhance those systems and change them along the way to ultimately become this transformational organization. So, uh, Terry, just real yeah. quick. Um, so, with the with the previous slide and and kind of the um, you know the the path, excuse me, the path that that Dartmouth Health is on as an as an organization, um, and you may not be able to answer this only because you've only been you know with the organization for just under a year, um, but were there kind of specific um, incidences or reasons or you know. Uh, uh, culture shift or, or something along those lines that kind of precipitated having this this independent organization come in and, and kind of do this assessment to um, help Dartmouth Health kind of, you know, get onto the trajectory that they need to be on? Yeah, great question, Anthony. You know, and not unlike many healthcare organizations, and I would say really organizations um, even outside of healthcare, Dartmouth Health was most certainly um, deeply, deeply touched by the murder of George Floyd in 2020. And for many of our employees, it was it was um, a very eye opening experience to the racial inequalities that exist within our nation to the um, the depth of the systemic racism that also exists within within our nation and and I and also in having a very forward thinking more progressive leader such like Joanne Conroy and having Dr. Conroy um, who is someone who's always really been a trailblazer around gender inequality and fighting for you know women to uh, receive equal pay, receive equal career promotion. Um, you know, she was very passionate about the need for Dartmouth Health to have a really sincere and sustainable and long-term office and um and also an area of focus around DEIB. So, you know, I definitely the the murder of George F Floyd was a was a catalyst. Um, and it also gave a lot of our employees who maybe had otherwise not been aware, one, to now have some awareness. Two, for those employees who had known but were silent, who didn't feel like they could come forward with their voice to then begin to really express, you know, what has happened is indicative. It may not be at the same degree, but it's representative. It's representative of what I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing here within Dartmouth Health. I haven't had a platform and I haven't known how to bring that forward. So I think that um, what that also allowed was for us to recognize, you know what, we're not the experts in this space. 
we don't know. We are experts of, you know, innovative, you know, forward thinking um, clinical care that we deliver. But this is a this is a whole new channel for us. And so if we if we do want to really make meaningful contributions and have a meaningful difference, we're going to have to bring in experts to help us with that. And they, you know, ultimately selected Be Equitable to be that that expert and to be that partner for us. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. But great question too. So as we do look ahead to what our future is. You know, one of the the very first things that I had the honor of of doing in partnership with our DEIB steering committee and really delving deep into the assessment was what are our goals? What do we want to focus on? Because there's so much work to be done and it can get actually a little it can be so overwhelming that you can become paralyzed by there's so much work that you want to that you want to do and you want to accomplish and there's um, and with all of this energy and all of this passion, like how do we how do we harness this? So at the end of the day, what our overarching goal is to advance health equity. That's really what we want to see. We want to see those who have not been able to have access to care because of educational barriers, because of transportation barriers, because of socioeconomic differences, because of bias that exists within um, within all of us and understanding those bias, but with even bias that, ex that is built into some of our policies, bias that is present in our day-to-day -day interactions, bias that's present even in our practices, how can we address that in order to advance health equity so that everyone really has the, not just, not equal opportunity, because that's really, that's the equality, but has the opportunity and the access that they need based upon where they are, based upon their position. And with that advancement of health equity, we also determined that there's four key pillars. There's four core pillars within DEIB that we are focusing on. And that is the equity, the psychological safety, community engagement, and social justice. So everything that we do is through that lens, through that lens of our core pillars in order to achieve the overarching goal of advancing health equity. And then with those four, four goals that are there on the slide there in, in front of you, really about helping um, our, our leaders and that's at all levels of, of the organization to lead inclusively, creating really a culture of inclusion, creating a culture in which people feel welcomed, they feel valued, they feel respected for who they are and can show up um, in their true authentic selves and not feel that they have to hide or, or try to diminish any part of themselves, most certainly not that they have to play small in order to make other people feel comfortable. Um, investing in our DIB talent practices so that we can attract um, new talent so that we can really have diverse candidate pools and then retain that talent pool within the organization. And then from um, an inside out perspective, really increasing our DIB community efforts and the brand recognition so that Dartmouth Health starts to become synonymous with an organization that believes and is fully committed to DEIB. That's that's some that's the shifting from awareness to the action that that we're talking about. So these are the four you know big goals that that we're focused on within within our office. Okay, so I'd like to just share a little more about how those goals all fit within four categories of leadership, culture, talent, and then patients and community. So I'll just spend um, a few minutes briefly giving you some an overview of what we've been working on and some of the the wins that we've we've had to date because it's so important that you celebrate each step forward that you take um, so again going back to the analogy of swimming in the swimming out in the open water for every stroke that you take forward right we need to celebrate that there's been um, there's been some momentum there and we we of course needed, um, that 
commitment from the entire system and from our board of trustees around the importance of DEIB. And so we do have that. And we now have a very visible DEIB statement that is present on the internet as well as the intranet. And it's now incorporated into all of our, um, all of our recruitments. So especially at the executive level and for our department chairs, that's out front and center so that individuals know what DEIB means, means to us. The inclusive leadership development was in direct response to what we heard from, from our employees in the assessment and that they did not feel and they did not observe that our leaders were leading inclusively. And that means that they were not leading in a way that demonstrated those foundational competencies of empathy and vulnerability, courage in really uncomfortable or difficult situations across cultural differences, as well as connecting with others who are different from them and then activating that in a very meaningful way. So we now have that framework and we've begun to share that um, and provide that education and then really aligning our CEOs with our strategic plan around DEIB. And we had a, um, a DEIB strategic retreat in November of, of last year with full participation so that we could all then begin to work together and be more synergistic in our, in our efforts. Next is around the, the talent. And this is really looking at the whole life cycle of finding, like sourcing uh, for potential candidates, then screening, uh, interviewing, hiring, and, and ultimately onboarding and retaining our, our, um, our new candidates. And so now we have a general orientation where DEIB is front and center. It's actually the, I'll call it the opening act of the, of the general orientation. And I'm, I'm saying that because there has been such a positive response to that presentation that the new employees are actually standing up and giving a, you know, literally it, uh, when the presenters finish, there's a standing ovation, right? Like it's a full round of applause for the presenters that they know that they've just joined an organization that is prioritizing DEIB and that they feel they see a way already where they can get involved and where they can begin to build community and where they can uh, fully express their identities. So that's in place. We're working with our talent acquisition teams to um, assess what bias exists because we all have bias. Bias is as natural as breathing. So what can we do to begin to disrupt that bias so we can make different decisions about how we engage with potential uh, candidates and ultimately select a very diverse candidate pool? The um, inclusive competencies for all of our employees is something that's also under underway. We've had a lot of leaders already go through it, but now we want to expand even more. And um, APD, so Alice Peck Day is, an, is one of our member sites that has absolutely jumped all in, raised its hand and working with Dr. Sue Mooney and saying, we want to bring this to APD. And even Joanna, Joanna, you know, right here at VNH has said the same thing. And how can we begin to bring more of these inclusive competencies to, to the employees? And then we've got a new um, a new initiative as well around recognizing individuals by their affirmed or their preferred names and their pronouns so that that will apply not just to their badges, but apply to um, email addresses, apply to the calendar, apply to your outlook, your business cards, in all of these places where you introduce yourself, which I'll share my, I tell everybody, my name is Terry, that's my preferred name, that's my affirmed name. My legal name is Teresa Lynn. So if you didn't know that about me, it's very difficult to find me. <laughs> very difficult to find me. And so that, you know, that impedes efficiency, right? So we're trying to be efficient, but we're also wanting to be very respectful. And this policy is is dual fold, dual fold in, in that. And so so uh Terry, before you you jump to the next slide. So from you know, from your experience since you you started here in the last year, um, has 
have you seen an increase in, um, you know, multicultural, multi, um, you know, racial uh, individuals c- applying to be a part of, of the Dartmouth Health Organization across across the board, not obviously just with Dartmouth Hitchcock, which we all know is the, you know, the, the biggest gr- uh, um, uh, hospital within the, the Dartmouth Health system. But but have you noticed that there there has already started to be a little bit more of a shift and the second part of that question is, you know, how how is Dartmouth Health doing in general as it relates to um, being more, um, you know, having more diversity in the staff that that are providing care to to the patients in, in all of our areas? Right. Yeah. So, you know, to answer your first question, anecdotally, we are seeing definitely an increase in the um, the diversity of the candidate pool. What is really important for us now is to actually measure that from a quantitative standpoint. So really tracking that funnel. So when you when you start with an open position, let's say you get 100 applicants from those 100 applicants, you know, can we, you know, capturing what is the identity, if, assuming that they want to share that, but what is the identity of of our applicants and then as we continue to track that, as that funnel gets smaller and smaller, because unfortunately there may only be one position. So of those hundred, then who moves on to the first screening? Who moves on to the second screening? Who moves on to an in-person interview? Who moves on to the final candidate slate before ultimately a position is offered? And that's part of what we now want to be able to track is to really look at when are we losing are maybe when are we losing candidates who identify as you know part of a particular racial group or a certain ethnic group or a certain gender identity? Where are they starting to fall off or where are they choosing to electively withdraw? And what's happening there that we're losing those candidates? Uh, and so that's that's to come as far as really monitoring um, that, that metric going going forward. And, and what we do know currently exists is we do have, from a racial and an ethnic perspective, we do have um, that diversity within the organization, not nearly at the numbers that compare to our, our colleagues and our counterparts in New York and in Boston and, you know, larger metropolitan cities. But not only do we have some of that racial and ethnic diversity, it doesn't exist at all levels in the organization. And that's another part of this work is that it has predominantly existed really only at the front line, at the entry level positions. And so where are we seeing those opportunities for career advancement, for professional development, for individuals to be able to move their way up within the organization and to move from an entry level position or to move from being um, a trainee to then becoming you know, a licensed practitioner, to then becoming maybe a supervisor, to then becoming a manager and you know, the list goes on. And so those are the opportunities that I think are gonna be really important for us to focus on of, of creating that, that access and those new channels. Great. Yeah. All right. So for the the last two uh, big categories that we're focused on, which is culture, and the next it's going to be the um, the patients and the community. So culture is really how the work gets done. It's how we go about doing what we do every day. And I'm I'm sure many of you probably heard you know strategy eats or culture eats strategy for lunch. You know, essentially it eats it for you know breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If um, if you don't have a culture that's really um, that's very welcoming, if you don't have have a culture uh, that's one that's inviting, it doesn't matter how strong your, your strategic plan is. It just won't survive because if the culture is toxic and and uninviting, and um, and it allows for discriminatory behavior, or it allows for harassment, or it allows for just you know acts of exclusion to persist and go completely um, unacknowledged. It, it, there's just no way for a strategic plan to overcome that. So we have the employee resource groups, our ERGs, and 
And I hope that our VA, VNH community is, is familiar with this because this is such a powerful way for our employees to be involved and for our employees to have community, for their identities to be respected, for them to get to know different people within the organization that they may not have otherwise had an opportunity to get to know and to learn. And it's such a place for learning, not just for socialization and networking, but it's a place for learning. Um, and so we've got seven active employee resource groups. We have had participation um, even since this slide deck was done. And that was just a couple of weeks ago. And I know it says participation over 9,900, but that's now exceeded over 10,500. I mean, just the, um, the degree to which and the... Um, expansion and you know the, the quantity of how many people we've really reached is just phenomenal and so it's great to have those employee resource groups constantly involved in activities and providing just recently even our our BIPOC which is our black indigenous and people of color um, ERG just had a um, a listening session or just a sharing and healing session after the murder of Tyree Nichols to just come together and be able to um, talk about what what's on your heart, what's on what's on your mind, um, and and have a place to to share and just be one with one another, um, as as well as uh, you know acts of humanity, acts of kindness. Um, you know, there's there's a war still raging in um, in Europe, and you know our Ukrainian brothers and sisters are suffering. And so our ability to provide some relief to them, to provide care packages. I mean, these are things that directly impact our employees. They may not come to work and say it, but at home, there might be, you know, they, they could have a loved one who's experiencing that. It's, they, they are feeling this. And so the, to know that they have an organization that will honor that and give them and give them purpose to give back really has such a tremendous um, impact. So we have lots of DEIB learning partnerships. Um, you know, we're, we just also st um, stood up the Inclusive Holiday Observance Task Force. Um, and this is a, a committee that's going to be exploring how do we observe and honor dates of significance beyond the six uh, federal holidays that are in, that are in existence right now. And this is this is a heavy task. This is super complex and complicated. And I am so excited about this group that is coming together to really think creatively and think completely not just outside the box, but think like there is no box and just come up with you know some fresh ideas of of how, we can um, of how we can be um, more inclusive and how we can um, just observe these dates that you may not have otherwise thought about and just ensuring that maybe meetings don't happen on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, you know, right? Just making sure that um, maybe you don't plan a retreat on Juneteenth. I mean, those are small things that can really make a huge difference to our employee base. So for the last part, I'll just share our patients and our community because at the end of the day, we're here for our people. This is all about developing a humane experience. And again, our ERGs have um, a really significant presence. We've got a lot of community health improvement plans, working together with, um, with all, also Dr. Sally Kraft, who is um, our vice president. Uh, vice president, I don't, sorry, I blanked. I was thinking vice principal for a second there. <laughs> where, where my mind is of having dropped off kids at school this morning, but um, our vice uh, vice president of population health. And so that's, you know, with the AHEAD committee that she leads and really advancing health equity and, and data. And while we've made tremendous strides in beginning to collect data around the preferred language of our of our patients and being able to meet their needs to provide medical care in their preferred language or in their primary language in a language in which they feel like they can fully understand. We're now expanding that to begin asking questions around sexual orientation, around gender identity, 
And this, this may seem like, why are we at, you know, it may seem strange. It may seem awkward. Why are we asking these questions of our patients? But this all helps us to improve the care that we deliver because how our patients identify is directly related to how they live their life and how you live your life absolutely impacts um, the care that you receive and the care that you need. And so our, our providers need to be informed and they need to be equipped with not just that knowledge, but also knowing then how to address it in a very compassionate way and a very inviting way for, for our patients. So that will, that will be coming out. Um, we'll be launching that very soon for, um, for our patients to begin asking these questions and giving them an opportunity for, for them to also enter it uh, themselves within the system, within the portal that they have access to. Um, and, you know, we, we know that we're in a rural environment and I, I think that's also something that's very attractive. It's very unique of how we deliver care from a large academic medical center along with all of our member sites, but in a, in a rural atmosphere, in a rural environment, which we have such opportunity to expand our telehealth um, so that we can reach patients who are a far distance and may have some transportation issues. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot that we're going to be able to do that to develop more collaborative partnerships, um, to be able to meet the needs of our patients so that when they do travel to us and they receive their treatment plan and they work together with the provider to have that treatment plan, then what's the level of success that they're going to have when they return back to their community, when they go back home? And will they, will they have access to nutritious foods? Will they have access to the transportation that they need? Will they have access to maybe some of the lesser acute care that they need right there in, in their backyard? And so I think that that's so important that we have that partnership for rural and health um, equity. Well, and I think, and I think to just, uh, you know, to piggyback off of that. So obviously, you know, from, from the perspective of our, you know, our, our hospitals and clinics and, and things like that. But then obviously on the flip side of it with the visiting nurse and hospice supports that we provide in an individual's home and being able to, you know, still have those same values and still having that same understanding of, you know, each individual is, is, uh, is, is an individual. They have their own preferences, their own, you know, choices, their own religions, you know, their, their, their own health needs that, you know, from, from one gender to another, from one race to another, you know, is, is going to be impacted in a, in a different way. And the, the beauty of, of the Dartmouth health system is that as we all have the same values of providing that type of care to individuals, there's also that ability to, provide it in the way that the that the patient needs it at at that moment you know whether it's in person um in a hospital or in person at the individual's house and and working together and you know and and to at the the tail end of what you were saying as far as then trying to figure out what you know what is available for that individual you know outside of potentially the scope of medical practice that both vnh and and the rest of dartmouth health can provide you know, and, and ensuring that the, you know, transportation is there, that, you know, food security is there and, and these different pieces, but being able to ensure that it's, it, it is, you know, it, all inclusive of what the, the individual needs based on, on who that person is. Yeah, such a great point, Anthony. And I, you know, our, our VNH employees have such a um, I think a unique and a really privileged perspective as well, too, because they get to travel directly to the patient. Right. And so they get to see, you know, the patient, um, not just in delivering the care, but they also get to see the patient in their homes, like in their, right. in their private environments. And so they can see ex exactly where some of the barriers or the challenges exist. They can, you know, um, they can offer additional education for for patients that are you know they're that are confused or that are struggling or don't quite quite understand the um maybe some of the instructions that they've been given and they right. so I, I just i think it's so 
important to recognize that that position that they have and how they can, you know, it's, it's not just about going to somebody's house and taking their blood pressure or, you know, checking their wound or, you know, doing, doing the things that are part of your, your job, but, you know, you're also really engaging with that patient and with their family, with their additional caregivers as well too, to really help them because we know it takes a village. This is, um, you know, I, I'm the only physician in, in my family. I was the first to, to go to medical school and, my parents have had some some health challenges and i know any time that you know my dad has been in the hospital he's looking at me you know he's like direct everything to her give tell her <laughs> tell my daughter everything that that um that i need to know that he needs to know about his own his own health but after um you know it's always after a care provider has left i'm sitting with my with my dad and i'm going through everything with him and making sure that there's that understanding and that's what our, you know, our Advantage employees have the the benefit of doing, of, of having that additional time and, you know, really engaging with the family, with the patient to make sure that there's that level of awareness. Yeah, no, and that, and that, and that's the the key and, and the beauty, the beauty of Dartmouth Health is that all of the different areas in which an individual would need some sort of medical care, you know, again, you know, specialists, primary care, in-home supports, things like that. Luckily, there's there's a big umbrella of, of all of these, these medical services that can be provided that are all working together in order to provide the same the same quality of care to the individual and is specifically based on on the needs of that individual, whatever they may be. Um, you know, so that's, that's a, um, that's a, just a great part of, you know, being a part of, of this health system and, and, you know, being able to, to look at it from that perspective. So, um, as far as for, you know, DEIB and, and, you know, the, you know, obviously you've clearly outlined the, the goals that, um, that your, um, you know, your department within Dartmouth Health is, is working on, you know, in, in kind of the, the short term of, you know, say the, say the next year, uh, you know, so, you know, you'll, you'll celebrate your, your one year anniversary here, you know, in six weeks or so. And, and then, uh, um, you know, but what, so what does year two for, for Terry and, and her team kind of look like as far as to continue on with, um, the, the efforts that, that had been, have been started? Yeah. You know, it's, it's continuing to, to swim in these open waters. Like we've got to make sure we stay afloat <laughs> for sure. But, um, you know, as, yeah, as I, as I come up on, on my one year anniversary, it is going to, our office is going to be shifting more of its attention to the, to the metrics and to developing the, the scorecard so that we can begin to really share, here's where the progress is being made in a very uh, quantifiable manner. You know, a, a lot of what we we had to do was, it was honestly, from, from the time that I started, it was really building from the ground up. And it was, it was starting with a very, very clean slate, which is what I found extremely attractive. Like I, I just, I'll be completely honest, like that's on, you know, why I said yes, you know, when offered the position, because there was that opportunity to co-design, co-create, be in partnership with um, multiple departments across the, the whole institution of Dartmouth Health to build the, you know, the office of, of DEIB. Um, I like working with teams, you know, I really, I like um, being, being a, temp, a team member. I think that very much lends its way to my, um, my, my clinical background of, you know, just being part of, you know, um, a team in which I couldn't be at the patient's bedside 24 hours, seven days a week. And so you knew you had to have really good, strong partners um, to work with to continue to provide that type of culturally compassionate care that's so important. So I, I see that in, you know, as we continue to expand on the foundational work, of really laying the blocks and those laying those blocks of education, of training, um, that will then begin to move to another phase of the block building of saying, now with that education and training that you have, how are you putting it into action? So how are you actually implementing that? So let me, let me kind of get, um, 
a little granular here and give you an example. So if we have um, if we have education around bias, around unconscious bias, around confirmi- confirmation bias, affinity bias, all the different types of bias that exist in the talent life cycle, for example. Now with that level of bias, how are we adapting our um, hiring practices? Hire, how are we now adapting our, um, our hiring policies in order to be more inclusive? So it's not enough just to say, well, I learned it and, or, or I knew it because we know if we don't continue to um, apply it, we can easily lose that knowledge. Then how do we begin to apply it and integrate it into our work in a very meaningful way and in a way that actually does create change? So that's that's what we're going to be looking at, I think, in this, you know, in this 2023 of what's that scorecard of what we really want to track as far as where we're um, what's critical. And then in 2024, where that progress is actually being made. And if we're not making progress, then again, we need to we need to pivot. So we're going to have to address, well, what do, what do we need to do differently? What do we need more of? What, what is, what is not working here? You know, I have a really close um, friend and colleague who constantly says you either win or you learn. So you, if you don't uh, quite hit the success or hit the target, like you wanted to, it's not a failure, but you're learning from that. So you're, you're learning from what didn't work and how do you need to reassess and what do you need to change in order to move forward? So if we're finding that we're, we're not seeing any changes based upon the goals that we set in our recruitment efforts, then it's not that we failed, but we need to learn from that experience and we need to go back and we need to reassess. Excellent. And so, and then the, the other, the other big question that I have, so, you know, um, the Dartmouth Health System encompasses a huge part uh, of New Hampshire. You know, a smaller area in Vermont um, that that is all a part of the umbrella and things like that. Are are there different are there different strategies kind of based on the geographical area that that you're looking at? I mean, so you know, for example, um, from the on the Vermont side of things, you know, it's you know, Windsor, Vermont. Woodstock, Vermont, uh, you know, for the Mount Scotty Hospital, Ottaquichi Health Center. Um, but then you start looking at, you know, Dartmouth Hitchcock in particular, especially with Dartmouth College right next door, which, you know, obviously is a huge, uh, diverse population of students that that go to school there. And then you, you know, you look at Cheshire Medical and, and Keene is, you know, uh, you know, uh, one of the, you know, bigger towns, cities within New Hampshire. And then you start looking at the community group practices in Manchester and and Concord and and you know down in that area and being so close to Boston and you know just all of that you know so so obviously you know as an organization I know that the overall goals remain the same but is there kind of a, you know potentially different strategies based on on the geographic area in which the uh, Dartmouth Health System partner is. It, it definitely is. We we most certainly have to customize our our strategy and customize our goals for the um, for the specific member sites for the the uniqueness and the nuances of a specific member site. And it's this this is not a one size fits all by any means. I mean, we have the same overarching ultimate goal of advancing the health at the health equity. Our approaches are going to differ and there's going to be for sure some variance um, at each member site. Um, you know, I had a great conversation with, um, with Don Caruso just earlier this week and um, the president and CEO at Cheshire Medical Center. And Cheshire has, was really one of the, the first, members um, within Dartmouth Health to embark on its DEIB journey. And, you know, Don was sharing when we first started, the emphasis was around racial and ethnic inequality. Now, you know, there, things are shifting. It's not that you stop. So you don't just stop, as I said, like touching the wall, race is over. We've conquered, you know, racial inequality. That's the case. (laughs) We continue, but he said, we're also shifting now 
to, you know, really focus on the um, inequalities around disabilities, creating an environment that's much more inclusive for our employees that, that have both visible and invisible disabilities, because we know how, how much that is, you know, impacting, do they feel like that they belong here? And for our patients too, for any, um, any patients who might be hearing impaired, right, who may have um, different, different ways of communicating with their empl- with their providers and ensuring that they are fully informed and that they feel completely relaxed and at ease and understand what, um, what the care treatment plan is or what the options are before them and so that they can really engage in in that discussion and in that conversation from a from a place of knowledge and and um, and on a very intellectual level so what we see that at each of our member sites things um, things are unique and things are different VNH is also very different because uh, the vast majority of the workforce is remote. The, the vast majority of the workforce does not show up at a, you know, brick and mortar site every day where, you know, people are congregating um, for meetings or um, hanging out uh, in the break room or, you know, that's, that's just not the dynamics of, of VNH. And so, you know, we have to look at, well, what's, what's most important to, to VNH? What is, what is most important to, to its employees of, what, what will help them to feel more of a sense of belonging? What, what, are, what is important to them? What, what are they prioritizing? And so how can the Office of DEIB be of service to them and helping to make sure too that they feel included right. so that they don't feel like they're um, you know, the forgotten stepsister, um, but that they are absolutely an equal contributor to Dartmouth Health and that they are involved in, you know, the activities and the um, the community building. And that's why I love the employee resource groups because uh, some of our activities, and I'd say a lot of them, quite honestly, because we do want to include all of the employees across the system, they happen virtually. Mm-hmm. And because they happen virtually, you know, you can just hop on your, you know, WebEx and, and you can participate. And we're doing a lot of recording of our activities, um, or our activities are even are happening um, sometimes in the evening, or I'll just say outside of traditional work hours, because I know, you know, there are people who definitely work after 5 p.m. as well, too. Not everybody clocks in and works a nine to five, a nine to five job. So we are constantly thinking about how do we make it as user friendly and as accessible as possible. So if you have a remote position, how can you sign on? How can you still join in and be part of maybe a book club or a webinar or an education session or a fun social event or, you know, or, or a listening group, whatever it might be, how can you participate in that no matter where you are? Awesome. And so with the, you know, the last few minutes that, that we have here, um, you know, I, I know you're, you, you know, kind of laid out what the game plan is for the next year around metrics and, and actually being able to, you know, you know, quantify some of this data and, and things like that. But from from your perspective, you know, over, you know, again, this is this is not a this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. You know, we're we're in a big, a big, vast ocean and, and you know, we can kind of go in a bunch of different directions and, and things like that. But from your perspective and kind of your personal goal, I, you know, I would say is, you know, kind of where, where do you hope to see um, Dartmouth Health as it relates to, you know, DEIB and, and, you know, kind of, you know, ultimately, you know, where, what would you like to see, you know, call it the next five years as far as, you know, where, where Dartmouth Health is as a system with DEIB? I um, I absolutely love that question because there's so many different directions to go. Um, you know, I'll I'll say from a professional level in terms of the the privilege that I have to be in this position. I hope in five years we can say that DEIB is integrated into our operations. It's integrated into the way that we behave and we engage and we operate as um, as an organization. DEIB is not to be um, like a, a cool, trendy, fun program 
It's not to be, you know, an add on. This is not about trying to, you know, keep up with just other competitors. This is um, this is really a humane issue. We're mm-hmm. here as providers to um, to take care of people, to help people be their um, to meet their healthcare goals. And um, and in order to do that, we need to have really culturally competent and culturally compassionate people providing that care. Um, and so I hope that DEIB becomes something that is just integrated into the work that we do every day. It's, it's like you just, it's like putting on your glasses. I need to wear glasses in order to see with clarity. And so it's very natural for me to put on glasses. And when I don't have my glasses on, I'm looking for them. I'm like, oh, I can't see as well. I hope that when we are involved in discussions and conversations that DEIB is just interwoven as seamlessly as like my glasses are on my face so that I can see with clarity, that is just seamlessly interwoven into what we do and who we are. That it's just, it's just part of, of, of our fabric. Um, and, and so that's what I hope that's, that's what I dream of. That's my vision for five years on a personal level. I, you know, I will share that having been the only, and very, very often have to having only been the only black female, black female physician in, um, in meetings on teams and boardrooms. Um, I really hope that we have a strong mentorship and sponsorship program that allows people of color to see themselves advancing within this organization, that they see that coming in at a, wherever they start, wherever they start is not the ceiling. It is only a starting point. And so that they can see where there is opportunity for growth, there's opportunity for advancement, where there's opportunity to move within this organization and be a really positive contributor and to be seen as somebody who's expected to be there. Not surprised when you're there, because I've I've had looks, I've not seen not here, not here, but in other places, I've definitely had looks of, oh. I didn't know, oh, you're the doctor. Oh, I didn't know it was going to be you. I didn't realize it was you who'd be leading this conversation or leading this team meeting, but not, not looks of surprise, but just, you know, those, those looks of, of you're expected to be here and let's get to work. Gotcha. No, I think, I think that, that all sounds, that all sounds amazing. And, and from, you know, from, from my perspective, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's nice to be a part of an organization that is putting such an emphasis on, you know, on this and ensuring that it's, it, again, it's, you know, it, like you said, it's like, it's like putting on your glasses. It's, it's just a, a normal thing that, that people, you know, know and understand and that, um, you know, that again, you know, people, you know, aren't surprised by who is sitting around the table and, and who is a part of these conversations and that we, you know, we're all, we're all here for the same purpose and we're all here to serve our patients the best possible way and ensuring that we're looking at it from all angles, from all possibilities, from all sets of eyes is, is the only way that as a society, we're going to be able to grow and be able to provide what is needed for this, for this community and the society. And, and, um, you know, I, I, I'm very, I'm very confident and very um, impressed with um, with who is leading this this charge. Um, you know, uh, Terry, I'm, I'm I'm very very happy to have had the opportunity to to meet you prior to to this conversation and and be able to chat with you and and you know get to know you a little bit better even through this conversation and and kind of understanding you know where you're coming from and and you know knowing that the the values and the thoughts and and the ideas that you're bringing forth are what the, our entire organization is trying to do to better not only you know not only the community but obviously the the staff and and individuals that are going to be um, taking care of all of these patients and and providing the support so um, you know this has been this has been a great uh, conversation and and. Uh, um, and I thank you so much for uh, for taking the time out of your day to uh, to be a part of this. Well, thank you, Anthony. I, I absolutely am so glad that we've had a chance to get to know each other. I'm glad we had this um, this conversation, this you know intimate chat 
uh, with all of our friends, right? With all of our okay. VNH uh, friends who are who are tuning tuning in, and I really, really do appreciate the the vote of confidence and and hope that um, that our community sees a way for them to get involved, that they see a way to um, to be active in in this work because this is not one person, it's not one office. It really and truly is going to take all of us. And so, for any of you who are part of Dartmouth Health who are listening or who are watching at a later time, really encourage you to search DEIB at one O N E dot Hitchcock dot org. And there's a lot of information on our intranet DEIB page. We have constant email updates, which we will absolutely be making sure that VNH receives as well. So we welcome you and just encourage you that, um, Every one person can make a difference. And so you can absolutely be that uh, one pebble that drops into still water because there's a ripple effect. So encourage you to do so. Awesome. So again, uh, Terry, thank you so much for being a part of this and, and thank you all for, for watching this live or if you're watching it uh, later uh, streaming on either YouTube or Facebook, uh, we thank you. And, and if there, if there are any questions um, that, that you want answered, you know, please feel free to, to reach out to, to both the VNH or, you know, the office of uh, DEIB and, uh, um, you know, we'll make sure that uh, we get your questions answered and, and for anybody who wants to, you know, be a part of the conversation, be a part of, um, you know, the, the process and things like that. Um, you know, just, uh, just let us know. And we're, we're happy to, uh, happy to have you join. So, but, uh, again, Terry, thank you so much. And, uh, and for everybody else, uh, we will, uh, we'll be back next month for another, uh, edition of let's talk.